Welcome back to the Character Corner with your hosts, Chris and Deepom here. We're here with another uh, small little bonus episode here. Uh, we've had some people ask us about uh, doing something for Pride Month. Um, and so we're going to put a little special bonus Character Corner together on some LGBTQ characters. And I guess moments and themes and, and, and some of the comics we're doing. Um, we're not going to really focus on like individual characters like we normally do with uh, Character Corners. Um, but we're going to kind of focus on some of the, the character moments, iconic LGBTQ moments and themes. Uh, it's definitely not going to be an exhaustive list. I want to put that out right now. And also let everybody know that Deepam and I are two cis black black men. So we are by no means experts on any of this shit. We'll try to point out some of the, the problematic stuff and some of the stuff that we're going to mention as we can. Uh, but I know there will probably be people who are way better experts on this stuff than we are. But we were asked to kind of put some together. And so we're doing that. We're going to do the best we can. So I just had to get that little caveat out there. So nobody uh, upset in our throats when we put this out there. Um, so... We haven't talked about format, so let's do this on the air. Yeah. I've got some people. I've got some things I want to talk about. Do you want? And, and I want to make this this caveat up front. Most of our lives are spent in big two comics. Chris and I are co- superhero comic fans. Um, there are wonderful indie books and indie voices that have been championing these causes for years. And much better. We're not going to talk about that and, because and, I mean, not not from a place of we're excluding them, but just a place of I don't think I've been read enough, honestly. Yeah. And, and I have something I'm going to mention just because I, I think that. You know, I, I feel, and we'll talk about this. I know, again, Deep Home and I do not have not done a talk on this one. We have not figured out how we're going to do that, which is why we're going to be discussing our format on air, and you'll see our, our process as we go about th- doing this. Um, but even with some of the stuff we mentioned, I know we'll be able to point out some things where, you know, sometimes a big two, while we love them, uh, they do things for marketing purposes. And, and while it can still be an iconic moment and good moment and good thing, um, it's clearly sometimes not fully thought out whereas on the independent scene um the the inclusion and diversity is usually more baked in um mm-hmm. and you see it's just it's it's uh, you know the ability of of having you know more creator giving creators more control over their own work you're going to see uh more you're gonna see better representation in in that work you just you just are and um, I think we mentioned that several times on here, and so I don't think that's any any um, anything different than things we've said. So yeah, so we're mm-hmm. definitely gonna. There's gonna be a lot of focus on the big two. I do have some stuff on 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 some of the uh, some some things outside of the big two. We'll bring those up, and um, but yeah, you want to start in DC? Um, yeah, we can start in DC. Do some stuff in DC. Okay. Um, I think that. It's been interesting. So one of the DC characters that I want to talk about is is one of the characters that they've they've said internally and externally has evolved into one of their big four, and that character is Harley Quinn. Um, um, it's so funny. So we Harley Quinn. We, I just want to say we did ahead. not talk. We did not talk about this, but I did put Harley Quinn on my list. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, what's interesting because they've made a very big point since I want to say her solo series in 2011, and obviously prior to that with some of the um, the Dini Gotham Girls one shots. They made it very explicit. They made it. They made it come more, uh, more than suggested about her relationship with uh, Poison Ivy. Mm-hmm. And since 2011, when you decided to, the spotlight's been bigger on her, it's been a very concerted effort to make her move away from being the Joker's girlfriend in this horrible, problematic, violent relationship. And now she, she's left him for this healthy, adorable relationship with Poison Ivy that's carried through the bad books, it's carried through other media, they're very rarely depicted apart from each other in any other media or even like um, like, like merch. They've, they've taken this relationship, they've taken this character and said, not only are you sexually fluid, but we're going to make put you at the forefront of all of our marketing for the things that we want to be in the future. The Harley Quinn being a big staple of the DC universe isn't something I'm a thousand percent on board with, but utilizing her in this way to ver- to to further their commitment to diversity, I am for. Well, and, and again, I think moving her away from the 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 very problematic relationship with the Joker and putting her in a relationship with 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 Ivy. I mean, even in Tom King's book, where remember when Ivy took over the world, and mm-hmm. the Batman and Catwoman's way of stopping Ivy was to find Harley and to get mm-hmm. Harley and to get Harley to talk to to. To Ivy and basically on some, you know, I'm here now. You don't have to worry. You don't have to. You don't have to go through this alone. And I'm gonna get right. you help. You know, so like that kind of stuff. I, I think you're right. I'm not sure about Harley Quinn being the staple of the of the of uh, the DC universe, but we also know why that happens uh, and why they did right. it that way. 
Um, but in that respect, I think moving, it's one of those things where, you know, moving her from a problematic relationship to something that's a little bit more healthy. Um, yeah, it works. It works wonderfully. And it's a positive for the character. I don't know if you're up on Heroes of Crisis, but her relationship with Ivy is one of the driving pillars there. I just think that they've done a very good job in not just making it so often, and I'm not going to, and this isn't apply to a lot of people we're talking about today, but it's very easy. I think this was easier in like the 90s and 2000s. It's like, oh, look, the gay character. And it's Harley's acceptance and evolution has been a very good, in my eyes, step in the direction of saying, this isn't the defining trait of the character. It's just a quality of the character. It's one you're not going to ignore. It's one we're not going to shy away from, but it's also not going to be the focal point of their story. We're going to talk about some other DC characters later, in my opinion, that were supporting characters that I think were almost tokenized, used abruptly for certain for certain reasons, and that's not what you want either. But I think also we can look at the time these comics were written. Um, speaking of times the comics were written, Kate Kane, the existence of fucking Batwoman is amazing because it's not just saying, "Oh, she's the gay Bat character." It's saying. Her gayness is baked into not just like this thing that she does or she dates women. Her entire path to becoming Batwoman starts with her expulsion from the military for violating Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Mm -hmm. And it informs her story throughout everything that's been mentioned with her. And then DC dropped the ball. You remember this, Chris, right? Yeah, we when we did when we did the Batwoman uh character corner. So if you guys want to know, we have we did a we did do Batwoman in one of the character corners we did. Um, and yeah, she proposes to her girlfriend, I think in issue 17, and then the creative team leaves after that because DC basically said that they're not going to let her get married because, uh, let me check my notes. It says, um, superheroes hmm. can't be happy. Hmm. Mind you, mind you, uh, uh, t um, is Superman married? I'm gonna go ahead and yes, yes, yes. Oh, hmm. interesting. Uh, uh, just real quick for my own my own knowledge here is um sure is, is Superman a DC character though? I well, I'll have to check my notes. Okay. Yes, it appears that he is huh. owned wholly by the Warner Corporation and DC Comics. Huh. Weird. Well, sir, surely he's the only only superhero that's married in the DC universe, then, right? I um well to be fair, these marriages don't go well. Mm. Wally's was a rage from time, as was Barry's. Um, Aquaman, I think, I, I actually don't follow Aquaman that closely. The Hawks are pretty, uh, pretty star-crossed. And I'll say this. If they just said the bats don't get to be happy, I'd have rocked with it, honestly. Right. I could have gone been, with that. I could have been some shit ass covering nonsense, but I've been like, you're right, the bats don't get to be happy. <laughs> right. No, if you're in the bat family, you do not. You get the word that symbol, you do not get to be happy. I don't give a fuck what your sexuality is. Yeah, you do not get to be happy. You can kick ass gear in like a grapple gun, but you cannot be happy. Right. You don't get a we don't you know, there's no there's no wedding ring in the in, in the utility belt, all right? Like, oh, shark, <laughs> shark repellent, yes. You, wedding ring. No, um, no, no, definitely shocker poet though, because you, right. never you never know. Well, no wedding ring, because you do know right. that yeah, you can't be happy with that bat. They may right. even shoot you in the head and make you call yourself Rick. Right. I mean, and it would, it, um, it would, it would have, it, it would have been, it, like you said, it would have been a shit excuse, but something you could at least attempt to make sense at. But the way they right. did it here, again, like you said, it's like this is like a character that is baked into the character's existence. It's not a stun. It's not a it, it's none of these things. It is literally the foundation as to why she wears the bat. Right. And so to drop the ball that bad on that is I, I'd also say it's also just typical DC, though. <laughs> so. Oh, no, that's, and that's a great point. And that takes me to the next person I want to discuss because it talks about the levels of erasure that happened in DC Comics. When Wonder Woman was introduced by William Mawson in the 40s, it, the bisexuality of Diana Prince is kind of baked in. Mm -hmm. She lived on a plant on, a, on an island of all women. Then Greg Rucka comes out and confirms it in a Comicosity interview a couple years ago. People went fucking nuts. It's insane to me. The same thing happened with uh, John Constantine. John Constantine was originally introduced in the 80s. He was outed in 1992 as bisexual. I think Ever I, since then, yeah. it's, we, it's been woven in and out of his characterization. Well, I, was gonna, I, had, I had John, I, I had Constantine on, on this list as well. 
because I mean, not just I, I need I want to I want to go back and read uh, and, and pick up some of the older uh, constant Hellblazer. stuff like yeah Hellblazer stuff like that. But I, I put them on the list as well because it's like then not only do they do they do it in the comics, but that's one of the characters that also transitioned into having his bisexuality on TV. So they made that's him true. bisexual on TV, and so I I appreciate that. That's one of the ones where I will say I don't know. At least making sure that see for me. So for me, it, it, because it's so inconsistent. It was so inconsistent in the nineties in the books. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like whether it ma- like whether it mattered to be mentioned or not. Oh yeah. That I have I have I have not great taste on that. But you're right. That's something I overlooked in preparing for this. Is that his his sexuality made the transition to large media, and that's a big deal. And and, I, right. and, I, and I think that that goes back into them using TV to kind of make to make sure and 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 bake it in a hundred percent now. So now you have to make sure when you're writing, you're writing Constantine, you have to do that now because it's on TV. If it happens on TV, <laughs> yo, we. And and, it, gonna and, it, and it wasn't and it wasn't <laughs> subtle. Like the, the the whole bisexual thing with Constantine is not subtle. If you're watching Legend of Tomorrow, it is. Well, it's, it's not subtle in Wonder Woman either because she makes those comments to um, Chris Pine on the boat. Exactly. So, like this, the, the, I, I, that's one of the things that I something I, I I brought these as parts of erasure because they've been kind of swept under the rug with the comics. But you're right. This is something that has transcended the four color and, but, I, and but, I do appreciate that but I, but, but to go back to what you were saying uh, i agree with you on that like they're and, and, and we're, we're on dc right now we'll do the same thing when we get to marvel sometimes it's like oh, there's, for sure. there's a thing of you know when you're doing representation i'll speak of this from this for me being a, a black person like having inclusion and diversity in in your comics is more than just saying oh well, here's a gay person or hey here's a black person like you have to Stick with that. You have to that those it has to keep mattering. It has to keep mattering because those are parts of those individual people. Like it's like right. you know, Storm being a black woman and a mutant matters. You know, it it does. Being a black superhero, either, and, either one of those, you have problems. High Black Panther run exactly, and so you have to have that stuff baked in. And so, yes, being gay, particularly in in comics written in the nineties, like they should have to deal with. Issues that came with being gay in the nineties, which was we there was a lot of I mean, we have homophobia now, it's never gone away, but uh it's almost I wanna say legal to be homophobic <laughs> back then. You know, and so <clears throat> like you need to you, you you can't be inconsistent with that. You can't just, you know, have a character say, Yeah, I'm gay and then never care about it for years later. You know, it's it needs to be a consistent part of who they are. So- and, and and not in a not in a Way that stereotypes it either, right? It doesn't have to. Right. Be, that exactly. doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be sexualized. Being being gay or bisexual or transgender doesn't mean you you need to be hypersexualized about that either. So there's that. Well, there's a great example that I was again, guys. We don't plan these, but he just hit my transition like a motherfucking champ. Um, Apollo and Midnighter, introduced in the late '90s, kind of the extreme uh, comics craze. It was done originally over an image. Uh, Midnighter's Batman, Apollo Superman. Yeah, this is gay. Apollo Batman. is the most powerful human being on the, being on the planet. Midnighter is the dark, brooding uh, uh, vengeance of the night, and they are in love, and they are together. And it's so awesome because I read you read the first Authority with a uh, Warren Ellis, and you're like, oh, it's again, like you said, it's not tokenized, it's not, it's not, it's not over sexualized. It's just a facet of their characters. What I really loved is that when Wildstorm got rolled into the DC universe, they gave these two their own series. They let them adopt a kid. Mm-hmm. Like their relationship is, they had a six issue miniseries in 2016 to the conclusion of their New 52 story. Yeah. Like this is. And, and, I they, say- and, they, and, 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 they, and also rolled them in the full cloth of the DC universe. Like Midnighters work with Nightwing. Yeah. And, and I'll say this like, because in, on, on one hand, there is a little erasure with that because they did erase the marriage when they went New 52. But the fact that they didn't mm-hmm. release, erase the relationship, I think, is a big thing. Because Didn't we, they get married again in the, the not, I can't. I can't remember. They might have. They might have. Okay. So I think, I, I think I, that, I, that, that was one of the big things where they were going to rebuild to the marriage because they felt like they wanted to get a payoff there. Right. And, and, that, and that's fine. And, and, that, and that, that's actually one of the good things because, you know, we've, New 52 erased a lot of things that didn't, they didn't get fixed. So... Having that come through with these two who gay characters, I think, matters. So, yeah. 
So there's one big gay character in DC who was I thought was a fumble recently. And that was when they tried to do the Earth 2 Alan Scott. Mm, yeah. It was one of the ones where it felt, and I hate saying this, it felt like a stunt. It felt like they did it to get the headlines, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to do that, you've got to have a story strong enough to support it. And because he was just one facet of this overcrowded uh, story that Earth 2 was telling, you didn't get to explore it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I Alan's got done as well as it's one of those like maybe not your best moments. But what's cool is that sometimes the smaller characters at DC are handled better in this regard. Pied Piper's been out since 1991. Mm-hmm. Harley Rathaway's been gay since 1991. That's another uh, sexuality that made a transition to the to the um the screen. Yeah, to the TV. Yeah, you're right. And while people say, "Well, I want more Pied Piper." Or, I think it's just as important to have supporting characters who speak to these voices and aren't the focus of the story, if that makes sense. Well, it's, it makes the world feel more real if, if one of the many rogues who fucks with the Flash happens to also be a gay man and then has fallout with the other rogues over it. And, not, and the thing is, not all of them, which is even cooler. <laughs> right, right. Right. Like some of them are like, I don't give a shit. Does he do the job or not? And others are like, like Mirror Master has a serious problem with it. And Cold doesn't like the Mirror Master's problem with it. Right. It's like, if you do a job, the fucking doesn't matter. I mean, but no, you're, you're right. I think that, and I actually do think this is something that the big two kind of need to work on as well. It's one thing to get the, it's one thing to get the headlines with the big characters and having the mm-hmm. big characters there, but you're absolutely right. In order to make a world feel lived in, you need to have the world around them filled with that thing too. It's like, it, what does it matter if you did a Black Panther book, but you surrounded all the characters that he's around by white people, right? They've done that before. And they have, I, I'm, I, use, <laughs> I use that as an example for for a reason, right? You know, and so yeah, it's like I think you need to you 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 need to make sure that the world you're in looks like you said. I mean, I believe this is. Well, this is Marvel's thing. I believe it, it should be DC's as well. And I think DC does do it sometimes is put the world outside your window. Like if you're going to be in New York City, you should see, you know, something that looks like New York City. And when you look around, when you walk around New York City, even though I, outside of the trash bags, um, <laughs> I had the piles the, of garbage. The, the piles your of city's garbage. disgusting. It's like, oh God, fuck your, do something with your garbage. All right. Also, four years that, I was there. I have all the right to speak. Whoever wants to get mad. I go there. I, I go there for a few days every year for New York Comic Con. It never fucking fails. I'm sorry. It just anyway. Um, but when you're when I'm walking through New York and I'm avoiding the trash bags, I see all kinds of people outside, gay, straight, transgender, black, white. Doesn't matter. It's like that should be the world you should see. And so yeah, it makes sense that when you have a um, if you have a uh. A, a, you have a, a hero or a villain that they'd be surrounded by people that are also represent that are well, unless they're like Captain Nazi, then it makes sense that they're all white straight men. So they'll tell on themselves. Yeah, they, they'll tell on themselves. Like that makes sense, right? But then, but then in that case, it should be everybody else, even the other villains should be like, "Hey, dude, the fuck? Yeah, we don't fuck with Captain Nazi because he's a fucking <laughs> Nazi. <laughs> he's a fucking Nazi. <laughs> fuck that dude. Captain Nazi strong as hell. I bring him over here. Right, right, right. You do you. You do your job. Damn it. Um, I do want to talk before we, and I apologize. I've just got a long list here. Before we get done with DC, I've got two more characters I want to bring up because I think they illustrate kind of the point I was making earlier. So the first one is, so for all of you who don't know, my favorite Green Lantern is Kyle Rayner. I grew up on Kyle Rayner. I grew up on those books. When Judd Winnick took over writing for Kyle, let me back up. Who is Judd Winnick? Judd Winnick, if anyone's old as me, remembers Judd Winnick from the San Francisco season of The Real World. It was all that season that Pedro Zamora admitted as a gay man that he had AIDS, and then later on, I think two years after the show aired, he died. Judd won an Eisner for a comic he wrote called My Friend Pedro about his battle with AIDS, and went on to become a very loud and out activate advocate for um, homosexual for, for for gay rights. When Judd Judd Winnick also wrote Under the Red Hood. So for those of you wondering, oh, what combo? Under the Red Hood Judd Winnick. He also had a long run on Kyle's book, Green Lantern. When he came to the book, he introduced a character in issue 129 by the name of Terry Burke. 
Kyle was a young artist in New York at the time, and his Carrie Burke's his assistant, given to him by Feast Magazine. Carrie's gay. And for a lot of the run, it's interesting because Terry was like quietly jealous of Kyle and his girlfriend Jade at the time. You know what? I um, this. Kyle, never, about- Kyle didn't figure it out. Kyle didn't figure out that Terry was gay, that he had a crush on Kyle for the longest time until Jade told him. So it's interesting because from that aspect, you get to watch this young man not only come to grips with his own sexuality, you get to see him come out, you get to see him, he and Kyle become closer, become fr- better friends because of the honesty and openness. And it's all these things I really enjoyed and I thought was really cool. And then you see uh, Terry get a boyfriend and you're excited because his boyfriend, Terry, David's cool and he hangs out with Jade and all these superheroes. And then Kyle gets the powers of omniscience and he gives them up. He gives up the powers of Ion and the next night, Terry's gave Ash leaving a club. And a lot of people will say, oh, they just fridged Terry Burt. And I think that's a reductive reading of the character because Terry was around for so long, because Terry was so well built and so well carried. I see both sides of it. If you want to say that he was treated improperly and that this shouldn't have happened to the character, I agree. And that he shouldn't have used this character's pain to advance the story of the main character. I agree because it ends with Kyle losing faith in humanity and leaving the planet Earth. But I think that 1997, 1998, for 13-year-old Daniel Palmer, that's a story that mattered. It helped divine kind of my worldview. It really did. Like this is one of those things that as I'm studying for this book, I'm like, oh, these are these are issues that actually touched me. And from the Terry, I want to now go to another supporting character introduced in the DC New 52 era. That girl was written by Gail Simone, and she has a roommate named Alyssa. And eventually Alyssa says, I'm transgender. And it's interesting because now Barbara Gordon's best friend is this transgender woman who doesn't know she's that girl. And it's played just completely normal because Gail Simone is one of those writers who who does it that way, and they don't fridge Alyssa, and we do get a transgender wedding in a comic book in uh, back of a 45. And so there's, I, I brought these two supporting characters up, because not because they're the only gay supporting characters in DC, but the two that really, for me, as a cis hetero man, stand out that still move me to this day. Oh, well, also about what you were saying before about <clears throat> needing to have not just your main characters, but also your side characters as well. You know, that matters. Like having, you know, Batgirl have a roommate and best friend who's transgender, who's a, who's a trans woman matters. Like, right? you know, d- in, and it's an important thing. And that's how, how all of this stuff should work. Cause again, like you said, makes the world feel lived in, makes the world feel real. And if you want to have true inclusion and diversity, that's what you do, right? You can't just, and I know we use the term fridge for like when you, you know, you're killing, you know, killing these, these characters and, and using them as a, a to uh, promote uh, the main character. But you can't, also can't box people in into their boxes and then have, oh, well, this person's a trans woman. So you can only deal with this and they only do this. And you can't have her interact with this person over here. It's like, no, that's not how the, that's not how the world works. Right. And so, and if comics, to me, I look at comics like I look at sci fi, right? Sci fi. I'll even go back. Um, Star Trek. Star Trek does things like having the first interracial kiss, having the first lesbian kiss. Uh, I've always looked at um, D Space Nine with um, um, the troll in, in Drexia and her basically almost being transgender almost because like the, the, the host body can be male, male or, or, or woman. Doesn't matter. It's they're everyone, right? It's, it's always different. So having these right. things, and, and these things are always part of, part of Star Trek. And so I view comics the same way. It's like, they might not always get it right, but they're usually miles ahead of any other medium that we're, we're looking at. And, and I view comics just like I do sci-fi and seeing them taking what, what, what sh- the world should be and, and trying to present it in, in that way. And so... I think having side characters just as important as having main characters that are, that fit into these categories as well. 
Yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, but I, I wanted to don't put a spotlight on those two characters because it's something that I, I personally resonated with me. Um, you want to go Marvel? Yeah, let's go to Marvel. Let's go to Marvel. Um, so what's interesting is if you show them like the the ranking of the first out openly gay superhero, you run a North Star. Mm-hmm. Um, Alpha Flight 106 North Star discovers an abandoned baby girl who's born with AIDS who dies weeks later that makes him come out as gay this is in 1990 this is a big deal uh, later payoff and North Star was never become a super prominent character but I thought that Making explicit the cross section of mutancy and uh, homosexuality was was a, a good step forward for Marvel at the time. We eventually would get the first gay wedding in comics. I believe it was 2011. Um, hold on, I have it down here. It was. I don't know. That might have been 2006. It was whenever a gay marriage was legalized in in New York. So okay. I guess it maybe it was 2011. Well, well, and, and I just think that it was. It's. It's. I think it, that his inclusion as an out mutant was very important because it made explicit what 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 had been kind of understood in the past that mutancy was more of a uh, um, an allegory for anything that makes you different or separate. But there's actually a super villain that predates North Star. Mystique and Destiny were lovers. Yeah, when they first met. Mystique was wearing the face of a man. Mm-hmm. She's a shapeshifter. But go back and read those Claremont books, which I'm doing right now because we have a wonderful podcast called Character Corner. It allows me to read comic books as part of my job. But they're very, it's, it's not a hidden thing. Yeah, not at all. It's very explicit, very early on. And I think that, as you mentioned earlier, is having Marvel kind of reflect the world out your window, allow them to come to this place sooner. And not better or worse. I'm not saying this is not a Marvel DC thing. This is just me saying that I think that their insistence to collect these things to 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 reflect these things, excuse me, allowed it to be more resonant. But even there, they were slow to fully integrate these characters into like their mainline comic books. Well, yeah, even with North Star, it like took a while to get to the point of him being able to come out and say that he's gay, and then even after that, didn't really do much with it afterwards. So it's like, you know, it. it there, there is. Um, they get credit for 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 doing it. But at the same time, it's like there's there's a difference between doing something and then fully integrating that stuff, right? It's like mm-hmm. when you when you mm-hmm. when you when you when the Civil Rights Act was passed, it was like okay, segregation is no longer legal, <laughs> right? But you know, people found some ways around that, or you know, you know, we're gonna free, we're gonna we're gonna free the slaves, but you niggas right here really aren't that free. You know, it's it's that kind of thing. And I'm not saying that it, that they were, it was done with bad intentions. And again, when you look back at the time, again, you know, what was it? Uh, he come he he comes out in I think it's Alpha Flight eighteen. Alpha Flight one is yeah, in 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 in, 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 in nineteen ninety two, right? right? So it's like. That's that again for that time period. You can look at that time period and say, you know what, that actually is an iconic and, and, and serious moment. But then we also can say, okay, but there were still a lot of things that we could have done better with it. So, yeah. But you got to get the And what's cool is I think that post 90s, post restructuring of Marvel, really, they did do better. Yeah. Yeah. You got, I mean, we talk about the list of uh, Wicked and, and Hulkling. Yes. Young Avengers won. Yeah. Yeah, coming out the gate, you know, like, and it's not just like, oh, it's a team book. It's a book with the word Avengers in the title. It's got the guy who wrote um, the OC on 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 scripts, and it's got Jim Chung on art. Like, this is a big deal for Marvel. And the first issue is these two out kids. Mm-hmm. It makes Wiccan change his name, which is such a dumb joke, but I'm so glad they made it in the comic. Because <laughs> when Wiccan first arrives on the scene, he's calling himself Asgardian, and as they figure out that he's gay, he's like, "You know, I'm changing your name." <laughs> but Patriot's like, just, "Just change that. Just, just, just change that." But I, I, I also love that their relationship throughout 
Avengers Academy, throughout um, Last Stand, throughout everything that they've done, put these characters through, it's been so strong. They found out that Teddy is the half Captain Marvel son, half scroll, destined to unify these two races, savior. So they've got bigger things to deal with than the fact that, oh, they're gay. Their parents are they're gay. Their friends are they're gay. It's, I like their story because it's devoid of the, like, prototypical angst around it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, no, no. They, they, they're, that's a really good one and a really good relationship right there, the way they, they handle it. And they're, like you said, they're constantly around. Constantly. 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 There's not, they're not characters that just kind of get forgotten about and thrown away. Um, they they were in the middle of a civil war, you know. So it's like they're, you know, Hulkling was. So it's like they they are part of this. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they're the front line. They're the front line of everything. It's 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 one of my favorite romances in comics. Period. Like as I was saying back to the reading for this, I was like, wow, that's a great fucking story. Mm-hmm. It's so consistent and well written and obviously loving. And then there are other times when like America Chavez. Mary Chavez is one of the coolest characters you've probably never heard of if you're not a deep comic fan because she hasn't gotten the spotlight yet. We're seeing that change with some of the new animated offerings designed to go for television for children. But America Chavez is a um, Latinx woman who can literally punch holes in the universe and just happens to be super gay. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I've liked about like, I don't know if you read West Coast Avengers, the gender and sexual fluidity there, it's just it's just baked in. It's Kelly Thompson. It's just not something you even think about anymore. It's just something that she's having to write it. No VAR being bisexual. But, uh, the, the, the latest Captain Marvel. He's bisexual as well. Of course, he's, he's an alien. Like, it's um, a Richter and Shatterstar. So for those who don't know the story about Richter and Shatterstar, for years there was kind of like insinuations in the X-Force comic, but then they were taken away when certain writers would leave and certain creators would have bigger voices, Rob Liefeld. Um, so, so, so before we go forward, uh, that's the whole thing I love about this, because Shatterstar was created Partly created by uh, Rob Life Liefeld, right? And again, this is back in the this is this is back in the Rob Liefeld era of comics. So this is big muscles, big 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 guns, big shoulder pads, lots of yeah. patches. Yeah, lots of patches, small feet, um, or no feet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hate you. So it's good. so so to have a character like this, and then you get the nuance and the loving relationship between him and Richter. It's like, take a character that started from that, that point of view, from that hyper-masculinity point of view of, of almost being toxic, of just, like, the guy... Like you got, and again, you guys, you, you, you know Rob Liefeld's work. You've seen it. You know how it looks. You know what I mean when I'm saying this. So to go from that to taking that kind of character and letting that character be gay, I think it matters. For sure. For sure. It matters. To see. Like you said, Shatterstar was one of those signs of kind of 90s hyper-masculinity, and the writers were like, nah, we're off that. And what you got was, in Peter David's X Factor, a very sweet story of Richter coming to terms with who he actually is, and Shatterstar being this, like, super coachable alien who's like, I fucking think that moves! Like, it's... it's <laughs> and watching them build, and then finding out, like, the lineage of Shatterstar, it's... Again... It's not a defining characteristic. It's not the, that's not the story. The mean gay isn't the story. The story happens around it, and it happens to include gay characters. And that's one of the cooler things, I think, about that relationship. But again, like I said, hits and misses, right? There have been misses at Marvel. <laughs> Put it lightly. The biggest, most recent, most glaring miss to me remains how they handled Iceman. I. I knew it. I did, that's why I didn't put it on the list. I knew you were going to bring that up. And how you He's one it. of my favorite characters of all time. And this is not the rant you think you're going to get. You think you're going to get the shouldn't have made him gay rant. That's not that rant. It's the way they had him. Hell, the way you they read enough body books. This all makes perfect fucking sense. Right. What I didn't like was the way it happened. The way they outed him, yeah. They didn't out him. Her name's Jean Grey. Yeah. They have her read his mind. And I get that Bendis was wrapping up his run and he just fast forward some shit. And he was leaving for DC and he almost died. I get all of these things intellectually. Man, I wish they'd done it better. Because the books we've gotten out of him pretty fucking good. You've gotten to see both young body and older body coming to grips with this newly discovered aspect of themselves. It was so interesting that old Bobby was like, when, when young Bobby calls him out, he's like, how do you have your shit together more than I do? 
And it's so cool to watch these time travel versions of themselves. Like Bobby, like watching adult Bobby come to grips with like the fact that teenage Bobby had been forced to be outed by Gene. Like they have a very, he's like, I got to talk to Gene about fucking boundaries, but she's right. Like I'm here now. Like this is, this is what's happening. And he says that if I'm gay, you know, that also means an adult Bobby's like, God damn it, man. Why couldn't you just go home? <laughs> well, and I'll say this. I, I think that's one of the ones where the, the outing was handled poorly, but the way it, the, the the things that came out of it afterwards have mm-hmm. been done better, like his own individual book and having a care to come to grips in terms with his own sexuality. I think they kind of helped clean it up. And I think that's, you know, even with some of the misses, I think this is where, this is where comics aren't finite. And this goes for both Marvel and DC. Mm-hmm. If something is handled poorly when it first in, inception, you can come back later and fix it up. We talked about this with how Chris Claremont cleaned up the stuff with Carol Danvers you know, after the rape of Carol Danvers. So it's like comics are, have a way of evolving and going back and fixing mistakes that, that previous creators made or adjusting to times and saying, Hey, at the time we thought this, and this doesn't count for the Bobby thing. Cause this is literally like what, four or five years ago. So it doesn't count for that. Yeah. But like for some of the older stuff, like the North star stuff and things like this, like, Oh, well we thought that this time this is enough, but we look back at it. It was like, no, actually that wasn't enough. That was just scratching the surface. Let's go and get, let's go and fill in more details. Let's go and fill in more gaps and fill in more things to um, fully flesh out this character in this in this moment and what it means to be who this character is. So that's the one thing I do love about comics about the the ability to continue on. Oh, for sure, it's the ability to to, to push and advance and and make things matter and make things more prevalent. Um, Victoria Hand, who is the who is Norman Osborn's second. When Hammer was running things, who ended up becoming a liaison, liaison to the Avengers, she's gay. You'd never like it's one of those things that comes. It came up in her origin, I think twice, but they never focus on it. And and while you're right, I think that maybe it should be more of the spotlight. But also, she's a supporting character in a team book. She's not going to have room to breathe. But it's nice that we know these things about her. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, let's go outside the big two for a second. Uh, big stories that were made a couple of recent years. I'm just taking quick notes for myself. Kevin Keller, when he came out, when um, they introduced the gay character in Archie, everyone thought it was the end of the goddamn world. Shocking. Archie still pervade, still survives, and is on the CW. And if you're not watching Riverdale, he's gay in the show, too. But also, it's the most batshit crazy show you've ever seen. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't talk about it in public just because, I, I, whatever, some things are just mine. But <laughs> it's insane. If you like crazy things, just sit down for an hour with the Riverdale episode. The last season ended with them being chased through the woods by two psychopathic killers who were employed by one of the characters' mothers. Playing a game. It's insane. It's insane, Chris. It's, it's batshit insane. This is my 20 seconds of talking about Riverdale. Um, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about my favorite comic book of all time. I, I had to put, I, I put him in. I was like, I don't even know why I'm putting this on the list. I know he's going to mention this. It's just whatever. So I'm sorry. For a race of transforming robots that technically has no sex, there is so much LGBTQ running through more than meets the eye. No, oh, it's, 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 it's funny because while you say there's no sex, but they definitely do distinguish. They do sex later. They right. use sex. Uh, they identify. Well, okay. So that's something else that happens in the in the books. Go ahead and say what you're going to say because I'm now I'm just ranting. Well, I was going to I was going to say that they do at least identify male and female forms at some point, so that the reader, maybe not in the mm-hmm. book, but the reader can identify. Oh, that's male characters, female characters. I believe at one point, even so, was it Lost Light that they had the transgender character that changes from yes, the male yes. form to I can't. So, which, so, which character was so that? at one point. Are the mainline transformers realize that there's been other colonies out there, and that some of those colonies identify themselves as female based on their interactions with biological organisms? So, like, like at one point, a transformer comes back. It's like, who's that? That's our. That's that's uh, Chromia. Oh, what's his name? What, what's his name? That's Chromia. She's a she. We have she's now. Yep, she's a she. And so, while the relationship between like um, Chromium Rewind, which literally brings me to tears, or Tailgate and Cyclonus, you're right. There are characters in Lost Light who decide one day I felt more comfortable in a female based chassis and being called a she. And that's okay. And it's one of those things that when I tell people that Transformers, especially the IDW late run stuff, is just high minded sci fi. Science fiction is designed to reflect the world around you while stripping away some of those prejudices that are inherent to make you identify things better and understand them better. 
Well, that's them doing this in more than meets the fucking eye and lost light is a big deal. Hasbro is owns a lot of my money as I'm staring <laughs> at my Transformers shelf from my desk. But they own Transformers. They had to say okay to doing this. Yeah, no, and th- and I think that's why it stood out to me, and it goes back to what you were saying about how you know we some of the, when we get outside of the big two, it's like it's so naturally baked in to the the conversations here, like the the Cyclones tailgate one takes a long time to develop. But it's, it's the whole it, series. It's, it's the first really, issue is him beating the shit of tailgate. Right. <laughs> you know? And so it's such a, it, and, it, and it's such a loving, caring relationship. Like you said, the Chrome Dome rewind thing is just heartbreaking. And then you get to go <laughs> the character, and, and like it all fits in, and it all matters, and you tend to forget yourself you're reading comics about giant robots in the middle of after effects of a war, right? It's just like, I mean, if you had told me, but then again, it makes sense because this is a, this is a, this is a story that ends up making me feel like space Hitler became a fucking hero. So it's like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so naturally baked into the stories here and it's done so well. It, it's done so well. And it also is done so natural. I don't know what the word to say. It's like, you know, the Cyclones and Tailgate relationship doesn't feel cheap. And like you said, it feels like it's the story. It's always been the story. You're rooting for it because, of course, you know, when Tailgate locks them, it gets locked in that chamber underneath. Or no, when they're on the planet and you think that Tailgate's going to disappear because all of them are, all the, the, the loved ones are, are, are really like ghosts or their memories or something like that. And he doesn't disappear. Like, what the fuck just happened? Oh my god, <laughs> Jesus Christ! This is you're, you're fucking killing me. I think that was like lost well, like number eighteen or something like that. It's like it's it's fucking crazy. Like you feel you feel for these characters, and right. it feels real, and it doesn't matter. And to me, that's that's when representation matters. Is when you right. can make you know an LGBTQ relationship or character feel no no different than the other characters, even though their experiences might be different. Right? It's like it just it it feels good, and the way they handle that in in uh, the way James J- Robert handled that in um, More Than Me Die in, in Lost Light was just fantastic. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because it's almost like James Roberts had more uh, freedom to do it because the book was about robots. I kind of feel like nobody, some people, it went over some people's heads until it was too late. You know, it, it, you say that, but also like it's winning Eisner's from the jump off the strength of this shit. Well, I don't think I don't, I, but even with some of the, I don't think some people real, I, I don't think some people realize what some of the stuff was. Cause you got to be honest, though. They ain't like, those, those, and, well, those, and those, rewind. Those are, those, oh yeah, true. Those, those are also <laughs> very. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It wasn't. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got me. You got me there. They're trying to find a way for people not know. Um, here's one. No, that's, and that's the thing I, I, I love about like I've reread this series I think twice now. James Roberts from the jump is like, this is what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And it we're here for, if you're here for fight, you'll get him eventually. This is some Claremont X Men shit. This is about people. Well, it makes sense also because, like you said, for the most part, it's giant robots. So, really, what are genders to giant robots? <laughs> You know, until like, until you watch them discover them in story, right? And then you're like, oh, but then even then you're still like, but does it really matter at that point? So when they, it, some and, decide, it and right. that's the thing is, it's so cool. Like I guess at the end of um, more than the CI, when they all think they're gonna die, they have the context and Dora and Conj- like the different levels of friendship. Mm-hmm. Like, do so you guys have what's called like a context and Dora is is, is a lover is a, is a someone in a relationship with. Contracts, uh, Amica is like one of your best friends. Like watching, watching James Roberts literally invent this shit on the page. Like this isn't something he pulled <laughs> from deeper Transformers mythos. He invented all of this, mm-hmm. and it adds to the tapestry, man. It, my Transformers knowledge and, and love and passion is not deadened by the expansion of it. No, it's more tangible. It's more real. It's something I can hand to someone and say, "Here, trust me. The story matters." And I have friends who read the uh, and notes um, transgender story. They're like, "Wow, that's a Transformers comic." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm it, so it, glad it, I it, you to read it. Yeah, yeah. No, I am. I'm glad you you made me read it. Um, some other ones that I just personally that I've read, and I, I got to throw this out there. Um, I just want to throw out the entire saga series just because the mm-hmm. way that they deal with 
love and who you love and how you love, I think it's, it's basically the part of the story that's being told here. And so you have obviously different species, different genders. You have chan- you have some transgender characters. You have, you have uh characters exploring their sexuality. Um, you have, you know, uh, straight male per se characters with transgender, uh, characters. Like it's, 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 it's things they put in there. And again, it, it's, um, it's something that I don't think you could ever do on one of the big two. Hmm. So, um, and I think not that, today, that, not today. Well, I yeah, maybe sometime in the future, 10 years or 20 years from now, maybe, but even then, but I like, think, I, like, I, 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 I say know. that, like, I say that, I think it's fascinating, and maybe I'm being super hopeful because it's Pride Month, and like, I'm, I'm kind of writing why we have hope right now, and Anthony Davis is free of the Pelicans, so anything is possible. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because you look at like the the loud and ugly vitriol, even around something like um, Jane Foster's Thor, but then you look at the sales. Yeah. Like, if anything, from a greed perspective, inclusion sells. Well, and that's a weird thing, right? You would think that as, as long as it's quality and as long as you you back it, you're gonna get you're gonna get the sales there. I, I think that creator own is always gonna be above just because it's just an, it's just the way the, the way it works. You don't have to yeah. go through. The, the hoops you got to go through to get the sign off to do the work. You can just do your book and they're like, all right, go and do it. I mean, um, one thing I didn't mention before it went downhill because I think it was the artist was a uh, woman beater. Um, it was a rat queens. Like there was a bunch mm-hmm. of, a bunch of little books out there that have that when it comes to uh, representation across all spectrums, um, they run circles around the big two, and again, it's because of you don't have to you don't you don't have the same level of scrutiny that you have to live up to to get to get these things out, and you can and the, and the creators can tell the stories that they want to tell. Um, and it also gives more it gives it gives more um opportunities for stories being told by members of that community. So you get more members of the LGBTQ community writing stories about themselves and people that are like them on their own. And when you do it that way, you're going to get those stories. Like as much as we love DC and Marvel, they're still white male dominated, you know, groups there. There's changing. It's changing. And I think the, the faster and more it changes, the more we'll see the leveling off of these, these, these things. But um, yeah, that's, that's just why the, that those are going to be there. So um, yeah, you got anything else you want to, you want to throw any other characters or moments you want to throw out there? Touch on. I, 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 if we missed your favorite character, I apologize because we could do this all day, not in the Captain America sense, but like we didn't talk about Alkali, we didn't talk about Jackson Hyde, we didn't talk yeah. about a lot of characters who are part of this growing diaspora, and I think that's almost a good sign. Because if we could sit for an hour and talk to you about all the gay characters in the big two, that'd be fucking troubling. Oh yeah. Oh, and also I'm not gonna lie, from a from a from a uh content point of view, uh there's a Pride Month next year. You gotta keep something bad. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep... I was trying to be <laughs> I mean, I'm, a, I'm, like I'm not gonna. I'm not, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to the folks. All right, it's like you guys are gonna want us to do this again next year. So uh, we gotta leave some stuff. And no, but seriously, you know, you know, there it's getting better, and I think the stories around because it's one thing to list off the, the the characters. It's another thing that list off the characters and then have the books also do the characters justice, right? And I'm hoping that when we come back next year and we're doing this, we'll be actually able to pick a, a few characters. And go to maybe they'll be written by you know uh, someone in the LGBTQ community, and they'll have a longer running book, and they'll have a really great story that we can really dive dive into, and go from and, and, and do that. So that's my hope. My hope is that you know we're seeing I, it get I better. Nominate. I would like to nominate um, the Iceman, one of those Iceman minis, for a uh, comic book club. Yeah, yeah, you've talked about that a lot, and so I've heard good things about that. Okay. So. Yeah. Um. So yeah, because didn't it re- didn't it win an award? I thought it did. It won. I think it was. I think it was up for an ice. I don't know if it won or not. Yeah. So um, but yeah. So I again, I think there's there are these characters out there. I think it's it's getting 
it's getting easier to find them um versus when if we did this 10 years ago we'd be struggling <laughs> so um i think that this is is moving in the right direction and right. i think this is one of those things that you know there's been a big discussion about companies you know latching on to pride month and commercializing pride month to me my thing is this if you're going to commercialize pride and and stuff like that then you need to walk the walk and talk the talk you got to actually put the not just the characters on because one thing to put the characters on there but then you also got to try to find the talent to write the characters and it's I'm not gonna lie. It, it is. I, I I honestly do believe that. Um, if you are a good writer, then you should be able to write characters, even if they're beyond uh, your narrow worldview. You should be able to write like white white writers should be able to write good black characters. You know, straight writers should be able to write good LGBTQ characters. I I fully believe that that also needs to happen. At the same time. You can help that. You can help those other writers learn how to do that by bringing in LGBTQ care uh, writers and, and authors and, and writers and, 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 and artists, right? Because it kind of helps. Like right. if if you've never seen, like look, look at art from a point of view as a black person. Like if you've never seen black people drawn right, and you start you're and by a black person, then you're gonna keep drawing them the way you think that they're, they should be drawn and never have that good reference point. When you start bringing in a black artist, like this is what you start, you start seeing, right? You start bringing in black artists, drawing black people, then all of a sudden artists are like, oh shit, I've been drawing black people all wrong all my life. Let me change that, you know? Same thing with writing. It's like, I thought the way I write, because you see this a lot of times, so there'll be a story that comes out, like with Kate Kane or, you know, even with Apollo at Midnighter, you know, you've seen some people have some issues with some of the stuff that happens there. It's like, People come in and be like, I like it for the representation, but this piece here, you dropped the ball on. And whether that came from editors and have not having an understanding or the writer themselves not understanding because they don't live that, when you don't have somebody there who can at the very least go, you should do that. So maybe it's not just the writers and the artists. Maybe it's also having the editors there as well. They can basically be like, yeah, they wouldn't say that. No, they wouldn't do that. Or, hey this looks bad. Have you thought about how you're going to do it this way? You know, it's that kind of stuff. I know that came up with um, Richter and Sh Shatterstar when they broke them up and people were like, wait a minute, you <laughs> broke up Richter and Shatterstar for having together what we're going to do. And I think it was our uh, Rosenberg came out and was like, no, no, we're going to, we're going to, we're still telling that story. So just hold on. We're still telling the story. They're still going to be around and we'll see what goes on from there. And I think that's when you're, when you're dealing with people that are underrepresented, you're going to have a lot of, you're going to have to answer those kind of questions because you haven't earned that trust. And so, you know, we're getting better. We're getting there. So that's what and, we're and I think it's important also to know that sometimes those voices don't necessarily, the people who are represented necessarily right in the best in their own voice. As I look at the Falcon series from last year, you dirty sons of bitches. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes. I, mm, yeah. Sometimes. I also think that as, as these care, as these companies, these characters walk down the road, there's going to be stumbles. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, a hundred percent. Part of walking. But yeah. like, like, I think that we've got to let, and when people get it wrong, we would allow them to say, I got it wrong. Well, but if they don't, fuck them, obviously. Yeah. Well, and going, the, the, that Falcon book is a good example, right? It's a good example of when mm -hmm. we were like, this is where you should have had a black editor. Because then that editor, between the Falcon book and what was that other book? Oh, the one that the Inhuman character they created. Um, oh, you know what I'm talking about. The one that the turn, turned... Oh, God, what was shift it? Shift or some shit? Oh, yeah, man. It was so terrible. Oh, my God. What am I yeah, these are black voices written by black people written so badly. Right. And, and, and I think the reason, and as a black person, I'm reading this going like, they were so bad. I was like, is it, is it a white person writing this? Then you find it's a black person like, oh, I know what happened here. You had a black person writing, you had a white editor, and the white editor didn't want to say, that's terrible, do it again. And so this is where you need to have the diversity <laughs> beyond just having the, the behind, behind the writer and the, and, and the artist, you need to have the editor there. And even then, it still might be wrong. So it's, and it's okay. We just got to fix it later on. So this is, was it, it was an Ozark. It was something like that. What the fuck was that terrible ass? Oh, new black. Oh, God. It was so bad. Chris. It was God so. It, I'm it really was, mad you brought it up, honestly. It was so bad, but I had to. I had he to. was such an integral part of Secret Empire, too. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see. God, and then he went away and was never heard from again. Never the proper from... ending of that character. Right. <laughs> and then he never heard from again. That's uh, about this. Chris, I just I can pull out comics from the 80s off the top of my head. I can't think about the I don't know the name of this book I read last year. 
<laughs> right? I don't know. What was oh, it? Oh, I'm looking at something. I'm now. looking at it right now. I can't remember. I just... Oh, God. It was so bad. It was hold, so on, bad. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ulysses Mosaic. My Mosaic. nigga, that shit was terrible. I was almost <laughs> like, you shouldn't let niggas wreck out. I was like, look, man. Yo, apparently we can't be talking. Yo, yo, I'm not gonna lie. That book was so bad. It it made you for like 30 seconds go. Maybe Cowboy Skaters have a point, yo. <laughs> Just maybe. Yo, I was racist as hell. Wait, black people, black superheroes? Nah, we don't need that shit. Oh god. We don't need that shit at all. Oh, Not man. my Captain America, goddammit. Oh, God. I was mad. Yo, between that and between that and the Fal- the Falcon book was so bad. When he dropped God. them Beyonce, I need you to listen them- to us. When we tell you don't all skin folk ain't always kin folk. We are warning you about those two books. <laughs> God. I'm supporting this black ass art. No, the fuck, I'm not. Like, I, I was out on Mosaic. I say the Mosaic for the entire run. Everyone left with me. Oh, oh wait, left. you read the whole run? I read every issue of Mosaic. Oh, no, Everyone sir. left with me. No, sir, I was I was out after four issues. I'm, I'll tell you what, though. Actually, I didn't pick up Falcon. Actually, no. no I heard what y'all said. I'm no. like, I'm not, I refuse to start giving them my money and then not be able to stop. Actually, I was wrong. I did one issue of Mosaic. I bought four issues. I bought one. Read one. I because like, you were like, nah, nigga. I was like, just read them. I was trying, I didn't want to suffer alone, dog. <laughs> like, Mosaic I, Lost Company I, is a cliche, but it's also true as fuck. I got three more issues of a Mosaic that I've never read that I bought for. I can't send those. Come on in, bro. Come this. on in. Finish it up. Be a completist. I couldn't finish. And the same thing with the Falcon book. The Falcon book, I think it was a, like, the, his when his sidekick, uh, Patriot, uh, dropped, like, I, whether it be Beyonce lyrics or something like that, I was like, who is writing this dialogue? I can't do this. Right. Black in the Ace of Spades, you're like, wait a second. And, 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 <laughs> and, and the motherfuckers that were complaining about Nick Spencer were ghosts all of a sudden. I was like, I was like where'd y'all go? Huh? Hmm. Damn it. Hmm. So you mean to tell me you guys liked him better when he was Captain America and written by Nick Spencer? Huh, interesting. Interesting. Weird. 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 Anyway. Um, all right, folks. <laughs> That's been enough for this bonus episode. <laughs> we will be back. Yeah. <laughs> we will be back soon. Um, we'll be back soon to, to, to talk uh, about uh, Chris Claremont. We're going to be back for Chris Claremont. Oh. I've got to figure out how many issues we're doing for that. What's up? Speaking of that, I was actually on Jeff vs. the World podcast talking about Dark Phoenix, a movie I didn't see, but those three idiots did, and I made fun of them the entire time for doing so. Smart man. Smart man. Smart man. All right, folks, we are out of here. Thank you very much. Make sure you subscribe to Character Corner on Spotify, and, uh, iTunes, or wherever you get your favorite podcast at. We're always there. So uh, thank you guys very much for listening. Until next time, we're out of here. Peace. <laughs>